Hey everyone, welcome back to the second session of the local church. Uh, we've been uh, talking about the two divine sacraments that was instituted by Jesus. Uh, one was uh, the water baptism and the other is the Lord's table. Right? Um, at the bottom of page 125, there are some uh, common questions um, that's being answered. So uh, let's go through some of them regarding um, the Lord's table. Okay, or and also water baptism. Okay, so uh, the first question is I mean, these are just some of the common questions, guys, and it's not the questions keep on coming, keep getting evolved in different forms. So, yeah, this is just a little bit for us to understand. Uh, here's a question If I was baptized before either sprinkled or just went through immersion without having been born again, that means without having repented uh, or really understood, understand what baptism is all about, is it necessary or all right for me to be baptized again? Right? So if you've been just sprinkled, sprinkled uh, and uh, if you just went through the whole process without really understanding what the process is all about, if you didn't repent uh, and whatnot, uh, should you be baptized again? Is it necessary or whatnot? So the answer is now that you are a believer, yes, it is all right to be baptized again and do it as an expression of your faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, so now you understand uh, what this whole process is all about, right? And so uh, we have such an instance in Acts chapter uh, 19, verse 1 to 6. We can read that later when Paul encountered some disciples who had been baptized by John the Baptist. He updated them about Jesus Christ, and after they believed, they were baptized in water in the name of Jesus Christ again. Okay, so I would encourage you to read Acts chapter uh, 19, verse 1 to 6. So uh, that's one answer that you can uh, respond to if anybody comes to you with a similar question in a different form. Okay, um, second question is, do I need to reach some spiritual level or spiritual maturity before being water baptized? Uh, what's the only requirement, guys? Do you remember? What's the only requirement for water baptism? Uh, do, you, do you need to become holy in order to get water baptized? To believe in Jesus. Yes, yeah, so you repent and you believe, right? So, no. The only requirement we see that, it, that one is uh, born again. It becomes a, a believer in Jesus Christ. And... Um, and you read all over it, all about it in the book of Acts. Um, the third question Can one believer baptize another believer in water, or should water baptism be conducted only by a pastor or a spiritual leader? It's a million dollar question, right there, isn't it? Yeah. So, so what do you think? I think believers can do think. Okay. Yeah, Anita, what do you think? Any believer can baptize pastor. Have you baptized anyone? That's no pastor. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay. All right. Yeah, I mean, the answer is pretty simple, straightforward, guys. Uh, you don't have to be a uh, pastor or some sort of a spiritual leader in order to baptize anyone, right? So uh, the example taken mentioned there is from the book of Acts, once again, um, is we see Philip uh, baptizing, right? So in the book of Acts, we see um, Philip, who was a deacon uh, at the church in Jerusalem, baptizing new believers. Uh, we also see Ananias, uh, who was a believer, sent to baptize Saul. Uh, right. Um, so yes, any believer can baptize another believer in water. Right. Uh, what if I took part in the Lord's table in an unworthy manner, not really understanding or having faith in what I was doing? Will I be struck down with some deadly disease? <laughs> um, lightning from above, and you know. Uh, and no, uh, just recognize that you took this lightly. Um, tell the Lord you're sorry. That means to, that you repent uh, of doing this in an unworthy manner. So now that you have an understanding or a revelation of what it really means, you repent and just move on, right? So going forward, you do this the right way. So 
that's another question uh, another interesting question is uh, question number five should i take part in the lord's table when the person leading the celebration himself does not believe in what he is doing uh wow uh, <laughs> i wonder if my, my first thought was uh, how did that person get there in the first place <laughs> okay so uh the response is okay so the question one more time is should i take part in the lord's table when the person leading the celebration himself does not believe in what he is doing uh in so in general there is no value in taking part in the lord's table if the person leading the celebration does not believe in what is being done having said that in spite of this if you have no other option you can choose to do this meaningfully through your personal faith right guys so you can choose to do this meaningfully through your personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross. So this is regardless of who the person or what the person's background is or personal's life, personal life is or the person's uh, testimony is. Uh, doesn't matter unless as long as you do it meaningfully, um, you know, with your personal faith, um, then it, it takes a different uh, meaning altogether. Right? So ultimately, each one has to examine himself and discern the Lord's body for himself, himself him or herself. Right? Um, the next question, can I, as a believer, take part in the Lord's table at home? A simple answer is yes. Okay, so uh, let's move on. I think we did that for two and a half years uh, <laughs> uh, during the pandemic. So let's not discuss too much about it. Is, yeah, the short answer is yes, you can. Um, all right. Uh, any any other questions, guys, regarding um, the Lord's table or anything that we've learned about so far? Uh, why is it not served every Sunday? Like in churches, they do like first Sunday, third Sunday. Some people do it once in a month. Yeah, uh, that I think it's up to the churches uh it's up to the leaders and how often they want to do it i mean for the longest time at apc we were doing it for once a month that was basically uh, it was purely because of the logistical uh, challenges mm -hmm. uh, as in getting the elements and distributing it to uh, you know uh different locations and all of that and the team was a lot smaller uh, and whatnot so and then about two years ago we started uh, uh you know partaking twice a month um and then about a month ago or two months ago i think we received a suggestion saying it's like hey, can we partake of the lord's table uh, every sunday from one of the church members from the congregation and so we discussed as a as a church staff with the pastoral team uh and uh and the church staff. The church staff is important because they are the one who will administrate and execute what we think of, isn't it? So we need making sure when to buy the elements and uh, we have to send it to a church in Mangalore as well. And so all of these things had to be taken into consideration uh, before we came to a conclusion and said, uh, okay, all the associate pastors were fine saying, okay, yeah, I think we can do this uh, every Sunday. And so from last month on, I think, or this month, uh, yeah, we uh, decided to partake of the Lord's table every Sunday. So, yeah, this is uh, just as APC. And, you know, all of these factors go into decision making when it comes to other churches. They might have their genuine reasons as to why they do it all Sundays, why they do it only two, two Sundays, or why they do it in the last Sunday. It's just up to them, really, as long as they are partaking it, partaking of it, and they're doing it meaningfully. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Anita, Leah, Enoch, Subhashish, Rosalind. Okay, so if we have no other questions, we will move on to chapter 20, uh, Church Discipline. Uh, page 127 okay church discipline this is an exciting chapter uh, okay it's 
yeah, yeah i'm sure all of us will relate to this chapter okay so uh it starts off by saying while leading the local congregation of believers there will be internal problems praise the lord <laughs> right uh there's while leading a local congregation of believers there will be internal problems guys i mean it's not like there can be or there would be there might be there may be there will be because you know people are involved anytime people are involved even in churches or ministry there are going to be challenges or issues or bluntly to say problems okay um so some of these problems will have to do with uh, the believers. Some uh, may have to do with the individual conduct uh, or moral uh, or lifestyle issues itself. Right? So there may even be problems with leaders. Uh, so that's what this chapter is all about. We're going to cover some of it and see what the Bible has to say about it and uh, how we can uh, address certain certain conflicts. Okay, Because this is very real. This is very important. Um, and I think all of us... If you're either part of a congregation or if you're a, a leader in any ministry, you know what we're talking about, right? It's very important. It's very real. We can't just ignore this topic. Okay. So the first thing is resolving conflicts. Resolving conflicts, right? Uh, can someone read Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 to 22 from the notes uh, itself, please? Matthew 18, 15 to 22. Anyone? Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 to 22. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if okay, he so, so, so it says, moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Okay, uh, you might want to highlight it if you want to. But if he hears you, you have gained your brother. That means if he accepts your correction, you have won him. All right, let's go on. Thanks. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Surely I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Yeah, yeah thank you. So, um, uh, you know, resolving personal conflicts or conflicts in general, how can we do that, right? Uh, the first thing is, so if there are conflicts between two individuals, uh, the preferred solution is that they resolve it between themselves. Right, so let people try to resolve it peacefully among themselves, and uh, and as you know, as Paul is uh, as mentioned in Matthew, sorry, if that doesn't happen, get another believer to mediate between the two. Like you know, another individual who uh, knows both the individual, uh, who will not be partial or uh, what's the word? Yeah, yeah, I think partial is the word or biased rather between one drawn just who would lean towards the another individual even if they're wrong all right so take an, another believer uh, who would mediate between the two uh, or an elder so the first thing is we it, it's best that they resolve it between themselves which is good for all of them it saves a lot of people's time and energy <laughs> if that doesn't happen get another in uh, and a believer from the church or an elder from the church uh, and see if that helps uh, well that even if that doesn't help uh, in resolving the conflict then that that's when the leader or leaders from the church can step in to resolve the matter um, right so to have a discussion with the individuals with uh, involved with the people involved and uh, 
And the whole point of these meetings will be to encourage and work towards forgiveness and reconciliation, uh, not to make an uh, not to make the problem a bigger problem. <laughs> That's not why the leaders would have to. I mean, some leaders or people would just do that. They would just jump in with an excitement to make a small problem a bigger problem uh, because that's who uh, it's some weird reason they get some kind of a joy out of watching other people beat each other up right but then the whole point of uh, a godly leader a godly spiritual leader is to make sure um, that you advocate uh, forgiveness and reconciliation right um, and so they, they try to resolve between themselves, the two individuals. If that doesn't happen, the third individual can step in as a witness, uh, you know, and just to make sure everything. Uh, go if that doesn't happen, the leaders can step in and, uh, you know, push for forgiveness and reconciliation. Now, it is possible that if, even if it's not sorted by that, um, then, I mean, it's up to them, right? They can be released from the fellowship. Now, it's saying in Matthew here, right? Uh, which verse is that? Uh, verse 17. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Let him just it could be like a nobody, you know, basically a stranger. It's okay. Just, just wash your hands off it. Move on in life types. Because you've done everything you can. And or collectively, we've done everything we can to help those individuals. If there's nothing is helped, uh, it comes to a point where we're just wasting energy and time and whatnot. So we just move on and let them live their life. Okay. Um, can someone read uh, the following scripture that's in the notes? First Corinthians chapter six, verse one to eight. First Corinthians chapter six, verse one to eight. Somebody else, please. Right. Uh, yeah, okay, sure. Go ahead, Anita. Please, thank you. Dare any one of you having a matter against another go to law before the unrighteousness, unrighteous and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest, smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then, if then you have judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? I say this to you, your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one who will able to judge between his brethren? But an but brother goes to law against law against brother that the, that before unbelievers. Now therefore it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourself be cheated? No. You yourself do wrong and cheat, and you do these things to your brethren. Right. Thank you, Anita. Uh, appreciate it. Right. So, uh, you know, there are certain issues that that that, that passage kind of indicates uh, certain issues that are more serious, uh, right? That would need uh, more serious intervention uh, from the church leaders itself. For example, uh, business matters or family matters or divorce. Uh, anything to do with real estate, land, financial matters, all right? And it could be anything, uh, sexual immorality and whatnot. So the other situations are typically that would need legal proceedings, right? Um, so the scripture that is mentioned that we just read uh, is instructing believers to bring even such matters to God's people, typically. Like first, right? Because it says, "Hey, uh, you know, we are God's people. Uh, you know, we can make decisions about this uh, on this. Uh, and of, you know, having taken certain decisions, we can't choose for people. We can't impose a certain decision uh, on the people. But 
we can teach uh, them about what the scripture has to say about it, right? Uh, for example, if, if 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 there's a couple who's uh, dealing with uh, who's fighting for divorce, filing for divorce, who's going through a tough uh, period, um, you tell them what it really means, what marriage stands for in the kingdom of God, right? Uh, the option for divorce is is really not an option kind of a thing, and see if there's anything in there that that can be saved to make this happen. Right? And so that's what's being instructed. And then at the, at the same time, we also need to know our limits when we say that we can't, uh, we can't make certain decisions for that. And I say this to some of my young leaders, uh, and I, which is something I have learned is uh, that I make myself available for certain young people, for a group of young people or anyone who's going through a tough period, a tough time who are just conflicting, conflicted with some things or they have something going on in their personal life. Uh, I need to know my limit. That yeah, okay, I'm their pastor. I you know give them a certain counsel regarding the issue. Uh, see, tell them what the Bible has to uh, you know say about this thing and whatnot. And then there comes a point and uh, where I need to know that, hey, I am not a counselor. I am not a professionally trained counselor. And so uh, after a certain point, it becomes uh, physically draining and tasking on myself as well. And so it is at that point where I need to be wise enough to direct them to a professionally trained counselor right, who will continue to guide them and guard them. It's very important, guys, as leaders, right, to know when to know, to know your limit as a professional person as, and send them to a professional counseling as well. Because... Uh, It'll start taking toll on your body and on your on your on your mind as well. All right. So some of the guidance when dealing with such matters, one is if possible or necessary, have a team of one or more elders or a team of people qualified, experienced in both spiritual and practical aspects relating to the situation who can help with the problem uh, so res resolution. Okay, um, have a one or more elder or a team who are qualified both spiritually and both uh, you know, who are savvy with practically as well to help resolve this issue. Uh, make it clear that all decisions will be made without any partiality uh, based on God's word and for the case of, for the cause of justice, righteousness, forgiveness, reconciliation. Uh, being, being partial, being biased is a very important key thing. Is letting the individuals know that, uh, you know, okay, one person might have been, let's just say, uh, again, uh, it's related to a couple. Um, so the guy has been coming to uh, my church for a period of time, and the girl has not been, girl is part of another fellowship. Um, just because this person comes to my church, I'm not going to take his side. I'll be partial only to him and say, even if he's wrong, he's right. You know, so you're wrong, go away. Now, it's very important as a spiritual leader um, to be uh, unbiased, right? Uh, it's, it's, it, it talks about your character, your integrity uh, as well, which is very important, right? Um, the third point there is put everything down in writing so that there can be no one claiming anything different later. In other words, I thought you said this, no. Oh, but I understood as that. I thought when you said this, you meant this. Um, communication, communicating, being crystal clear in resolving conflicts. I can't stress how important it is, right? To say, to make it, uh, to write, to get it in paper, to get it in writing, um, to say it's important is an understatement. Okay, so it's very important, right? So. Once the church leaders have provided their decision, the believers involved need to follow through. Uh, if the believers decide to proceed to legal court, the decision is left to them. The church leaders uh, have done their part to provide a resolution. Okay, so we've done our part. We leave the rest to the adults who can still have the freedom to make their own choice. Okay. So uh, I hope you are with me with, re with regards to uh, you know resolving conflicts. Um, it's a big, big deal. Uh, it, it's very real. Okay. The next section talks about bringing correction. 
Okay, so as a leader, uh, you see a certain things uh, are not right. Um, right. You need to remember that you are also a shepherd, right? Say you're leading a ministry, you're leading a church, um, you're the senior pastor, and you see something is not right, uh, you have to correct them, or you have to discipline. Um, there is a time where the shepherd uses the rod, you know. <laughs> uh, but bringing correction to individuals is best done in person, privately, not in publicly, where you your intention is to embarrass them and put uh, you know, put them down. Uh, that is so not right. And so, as a general guidance, correct individuals in private and in person if it's a critical feedback or you think okay this feedback is a, it's going it's it's you're saying it in truth you know that's the truth but you know that truth can hurt uh, and so and you know you choose a setting you 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 take them aside and you say hey this is my observation this is my feedback for you and you often you say to them in the best way possible um, because you want the best for the other individual. So when when the other individual understands that you want the best for them, and that's when they will be willing to receive your feedback as well, right? They will also feel honored and respected, and they will know that your heart is not to shame them or put them down or embarrass them in publicly and whatnot. So uh, it, it it's just simple maturity, isn't it, guys? Uh, you get what I'm saying, right? OK, uh, so bringing correction. And there are also in churches, there will also be cultural uh, cultural problems. I want to kind of uh, combine this with the other section as well, with clicks and divisions. Uh, cultural problems. Uh, any church that is rich in uh, diverse uh, diversity, where you have more than two or three cultural backgrounds, uh, ethnicity in the church, uh, again, prayerfully uh, bring it to resolution, right? And we see that in Acts chapter 6, verse 1 to 4, there was a miscommunication where there was a group of people, the Hellenistic Jews, thought that their widows were being neglected by the Jews who spoke Hebrews. Okay? They were serving food, basically. Uh, they, the Hellenistic Jews are the Greek-speaking Greek Jews who believed in Jesus. Uh, they thought their widows were being ignored uh, by the Jews who spoke Hebrew, uh, but the actual problem there was the language or administrative challenges, right? Um, so it was not administered properly. But immediately the response was uh, of the church was they summoned twelve people, right? Uh, let's get this right. Let's let's sort this. I think we need to get uh, deacons. Uh, you know that's the beginning of uh, the leaders called deacons, isn't it? Saying okay. We need to find people uh, who are with good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, wisdom, uh, and you know, let's choose them to resolve this problem and let's serve our people. So, uh, you know, one of the things about the problems is for every problem, right? Um, there is a solution. There is a solution that is provided under the sun, and so uh, no problem is too big which it does not have an issue uh, it does not have an answer so to speak right so uh, cultural problems can be sorted and it was sorted by the church as we see um, and 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 the reason i wanted to combine the the previous one the cultural uh, problems is with the next one is it talks about cliques and divisions so cliques are a small group of people right uh, that believe in a certain thing uh, now it could be because cultural, like say, okay, I'm, I am part of this cultural group, and so I form a clique, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm part of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm part of this ethnicity, so that forms a clique. Um, you know, I speak a certain language, uh, you know, so that becomes a thing, and I follow basketball, so I'm, I'm part of that group. I'm part. Of, you know, and I, I don't really mingle with anybody else. So that's those are clicks, and the, it's this possibility that a certain click or group of people can lead to a division of a church. And so Paul is writing in First Corinthians three, verse three to four, says, "You are still carnal, for where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, you are, you are not carnal and behaving like uh, mere men." 
for when one says I am of Paul and another says I am of Apollos are you not carnal right uh, verse, first Corinthians 4 21 says what do you want shall I come to you with a rod or in love and the spirit of gentleness so what is happening there that means there were a clique of people right group of people who were taking Paul's aside and there were others this is all in the church who would say I am of Paul I am of Apollos and Paul is like guys seriously grow up stop behaving like kids or you know stop behaving like uh, you know carnal people okay uh, don't cause division or confusion in the church uh, when you do that you are behaving carnally so uh, avoid that it, this is a simple message to the congregation itself right so uh, the corinthian church had numerous internal problems this is just one of many right uh, one of which was strife and division because of people taking sides with different ministers of god or oh, today this pastor is speaking so that's i'm i'm going to come to church uh, or today this so and so person is speaking preaching uh, i don't like this person i don't like the way she preaches he preaches so i'm not going to come to church as like uh, why is this person in the leadership this person understand doesn't understand bible or theology or doctrine etc uh, etc et you see what can cause divisions right i'm kind of sure that most of us have been there seen there heard that some you know uh, you know what i'm talking about so um so paul addressed this issue by writing teaching and instructing the believers in right conduct okay the three phases to it he's addressing this issue by writing uh, and teaching that's important isn't it so you're not just addressing the issue for the sake of okay this is the problem guys and he's not just walking away without providing them the solution he's teaching them and then he's instructing them in the right conduct and he also encourages their alignment to what he has to say and was prepared to deal with it in person if necessary it's like okay you either listen to me to what i have to write and say or i have no problem coming and meeting you in person and so paul is almost like you know what will happen if i come and meet you all in person right so can you just imagine how paul could transform cities with just the power of a pen it's just amazing right you could be sitting in another city and then just touch a nerve of you know other people living in another city and say i know i know what's happening watch it types you know um and so it's the same thing with uh, you know creating division and all the other conflicts and one of the other important conflicts that uh uh, that happens in the church is the moral issue one among the many uh, challenges in the Corinthians church was not just divisions uh, but they also had morality issues right so Paul addresses this sternly uh, you know he's saying you know deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Okay, that's in first corinthians chapter 5 verse 5 uh, and it goes on to say put away from yourself this evil person uh, once they had uh, and so once they had done this uh, you know then paul writes about the same person in second corinthians chapter 2 verse 6 8 so the heart of correction even even when paul is being harsh and very strict and stern he's saying his heart is do this so that this person will be saved on the day of Jesus, right? And so once, and then he corrects this person who's lived a uh, immoral life, and then in Second Corinthians two six eight he says, "This punishment, which was inflicted by the majority, is sufficient for such a man, so that on the contrary, you ought to rather to forgive and comfort him, lest per lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow." Therefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. Okay, um, so correction for the sake of correction is not enough. Uh, you again, your intention why are you correcting that person? Uh, do you want to see the best for them? Is that your intention? Is that your heart for them? 
and that is when your collection uh, you know uh, takes on a different uh, meaning altogether right um, so it the bottom line is love you're correcting the person because you love that person you want the best for that person okay so that is uh, moral issues and uh, the other section talks about disorderly behavior a disorderly behavior so uh, can, can someone read second thessalonians 3 16 6 to 15 please the one in the notes Second Corinthians, Second Thessalonians, chapter three, verse sixteen to fifteen. But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. For you yourself know how you are to follow us. For we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you, not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busy bodies. Now those who are such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. And if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, know that person and do not keep company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Yeah, thank you. Right, and so... Here, Paul is again just talking about uh, in disorderly behavior when uh, if there are, if there is a person or an individual uh, who is not working to earn their living, indulging in gossip, uh, you know, or other behavior that is not appropriate with for, for believers, uh, Paul is simply saying they need to be warned, they need to be corrected, and you don't demonize that person. <laughs> right uh, you don't demonize them um, you don't treat them as an enemy uh, but then admonish them uh, again the bottom line is love right so if they do not change then we are not to continue encouraging them or not befriend them so that they realize what they are doing is wrong okay so the whole point is that they realize what what is happening and um, but we don't demonize them so to speak so that is correcting disorderly behavior as leaders as ministers and say he's like hey what's going on why are you living such a life this is not right okay so wake up uh kind of thing okay there are all kinds of people isn't it guys uh, who comes in all different shapes and sizes uh it's entertaining uh, the word that i would use is characters no they have we have all kinds of characters <laughs> uh right and so the other one is deceiving brethren uh you know who who would talk about false doctrine uh you know who deceive people or manipulate um you know that's again mentioned in corinthians and galatians uh one of the challenges that paul faced and the new church uh is in the church of corinth and galatia is false apostles uh preaching wrong doctrines right and and paul addresses this in his letter to galatians where he uh, he amplified the truth of our liberty in Christ and challenges the brethren to walk in spirit and not by the law. So there was a uh, misunderstanding there was what Galatians, uh, the Jews would say that, okay, Gentiles, if you're going to believe in uh, in our gospel, you need to get circumcised and believe and live like us. And, um, and that was addressed by Paul and saying, that's not necessary. And, you know, there was... Uh, uh, conflict of truth between Paul and, and and Peter, but then again they met and they discussed and they they took their stand, right? So that is deceiving brethren, uh, false doctrine, false teaching, uh, and then there are opposing brethren uh, who would uh, oppose your leadership or your authority or any anything that you have to say or do, right? And this happens um, uh, again to Paul uh, at Ephesus. Uh, he faced opposition from a few men who probably had been believers from the local church body. So, and he's writing that in the letter to Timothy. He says, First Timothy chapter one, verse nineteen to twenty, saying, "Having faith and a good conscience, 
which uh, which some having rejected concerning this, the faith have suffered shipwreck uh, of whom are uh, Hymenaeus and Alexander whom I deliver to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme second uh, Timothy chapter 2 verse 16 to 18 he says but shun profane and idle babblings for they will increase no more ungodliness to, they will increase to more ungodliness and their message will spread like cancer Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort who have strayed concerning the truth saying that the resurrection is already past and they overthrow the faith of some Alexander uh, the coppersmith did me much harm may the Lord repay him according to his works verse 15 says you must also be aware of him for he has greatly resisted our words so there are certain people who used to be with Paul seem to have a uh, kind of uh, gone off off track and started opposing him we don't know the details of it but then a few names are being mentioned uh, in Paul's letter to Timothy right? um, so they somehow seem to have become rebellious and openly challenged Paul's teaching and promoted their wrong teachings and Paul addresses this publicly by instructing believers not to be moved by their teachings. So there are certain things that need to be addressed publicly as well. You see that certain things are causing harm to your congregation. Uh, your flock is being deceived. And that's when you as a shepherd, you protect them. And you correct them publicly and say, it's like, hey, there are a few who's going about preaching the wrong doctrine. It's not what it is. This is what is right. So you you correct them uh, publicly because for the sake uh, of your congregation, right? Um, so you guys, I, are you with me? Yeah, you following what's happening, right? These are all very real, very uh, uh, real problems that happens uh, in our churches internally, right? Um, it's again very similar to the other, other topic there at the bottom of page one thirty one where. Uh, talks about correcting leaders right correcting leaders so as uh, first Timothy chapter 5 verse 19 to 22 he says do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses those who are sending rebuke in the presence of all but that the rest also may fear I charge you before God that the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice doing nothing with partiality do not lay um, hands on anyone hastily nor share in others people's sins keep yourself pure okay so when it comes to correcting leaders uh, saying be extra careful why because don't just go ahead with what one person is saying right uh, you all there are always uh, two sides to a coin so to speak you need like two hands to clap uh, there are always two, two sides to a story so don't come to a conclusion or jump to a conclusion based on one person's uh, witness or testimony. Um, have multiple testimonies, if possible, before you take a decision of correcting a leader. So that's a gist of that passage, uh, is don't jump, jump into conclusion. right? Because that leads, uh, so say, you know, okay, the, the leader is uh, found guilty, um, you know, and have done something wrong um, how do you restore uh, we we need to be uh, we need to restore help the person uh, to restoration as well isn't it so galatians chapter 6 verse 1 says brethren if a man is overtaken in any trespass you who are spiritual restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness considering yourself lest you also be tempted so uh, as leaders we've seen it uh, that Christian leaders men and women of God uh, fall uh, fail uh, you know into various kind of things like misuse of money sexual immorality abuse of people uh, and the list can go on isn't it and so and other as fellow leaders it is it is our responsibility to not ignore of what is happening or just brush it under the carpet for the reputation of your ministry okay 
if I correct this person and or say so and so person from my ministry has done such a thing, uh, it's going to affect uh, the image of my ministry. And so I'm going to ignore it. I'm going to brush it under the carpet. That's the worst thing that you can do, right? Uh, and so it's your responsibility to address it, uh, the issue, not ignore it of what is happening, but lovingly and bring healing and restoration, right? So it is advisable, a practical thing to do is to ask that person to take a break uh, from all kinds of ministry to step down from all kinds of ministry just to take time to be in god's presence uh you know until they are healed and only when we recognize that there has been healing and strength restored uh, then we can release them back into ministry right so in that period we walk with them you try to address what was the root of that issue or whatever the issue that caused them to sin or fall uh if it was um, misuse of money you 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 sit with them you walk with them and understand what was the root cause for this thing and then once you realize that they have been restored and strengthened um then you can reintroduce them back into ministry but until that happens uh it's best that they are on a break for their own sake and for the sake of everybody else in ministry right um Hey Isaac, no worries. That's fine. Uh, anyways, the sessions will be recorded and so you can catch up uh, later on. No worries. Okay. Uh, and so, and it's also very important for us to understand that we don't use our authority as leaders to abuse uh, people. Um, and uh, I mean, it's just, and this is also real where people misuse uh, or abuse their. Uh, their leadership and authority over people to just embarrass them or bring them down unnecessarily and whatnot. So uh, that will be spoken of against your integrity and your character, right? And so, guys, we've been talking about correction. Uh, and correction, <laughs> and if you've ever corrected someone, uh, you know what, um, you know, what I'm talking about. Uh, you know, at the bottom of page 132, be prepared for different responses to correction okay so when we bring correction some people may receive it well some may not receive it well they may respond negatively receive uh, so receiving negative responses from the very ones you love could be very painful right so when you correct someone uh, they may react in a certain way complaining suddenly the world becomes totally different to the individual who has received correction what was so wonderful and beautiful suddenly becomes a wilderness or a desert place uh, the individual begins to complain about every little thing uh, or there can be withdrawal the individual who was corrected withdraws or disconnects and hides away in a shell goes into a shell or there's a retaliation because you did this i'm going to make sure you're going to have a bad name <laughs> or departure right they would or they would just leave the church and go because they received correction they get offended and uh, they think that they did not deserve it and they would leave the church and go. So what can we do in a certain situation? Uh, we need to understand as leaders do not to take it personally. Uh, someone else's inability to receive correction is not your fault. Okay, so you need to get that through your head. And another person's inability to receive correction when it is corrected with all the good intention, with love, um, if they take it, if they take offense or retaliate or depart or complain, it's not your fault. Okay, um, you you guard your heart. You don't get offended because of that. You know, give people give time for people to change. If they need a break, if that's what they want, just give them their space. Let them change. Hope for them to change, and allow them to move in uh, move on in peace. This is very important, guys. Uh, is you need to allow them to move on. Like it's okay to wash your hands and just say, okay, I done, I did what I had to do. If that person wants to move on, it's okay to let them go. Right? Don't be scared. It's like, okay, yo, know, this person is an amazing musician. If this person walks away, I'm not going to have a, uh, you know, a, a good musician. I'm going to be losing out. The what is that? FOMO. Uh, that's the word that we use these days. Fear of missing out. <laughs> uh, it's okay. You don't need to have a FOMO. Or the, okay let, let the person move on it's all right so don't take it personally don't get offended uh you know 
give people time to change, um, allow them to move on in peace. But what is very important is that you do not procrastinate in correcting the individual. Okay, don't delay. Uh, that's I and it's I'm not just sharing this because it's in the notes, but that is something I've learned in the last four years of my life uh, in being part of the full time ministry is that uh, the the more the longer you delay in correcting an individual, the root just keeps growing so deep. And when the time comes to finally correct that, you know, just taking out a tree that's that's a hundred years old is very very hard, right? Uh, it's easy. It, it's very easy to just add to a mistake than to undo a knot. Have you ever tried undoing a knot? It's just not a pleasant thing, is right? And so, don't do not procrastinate in uh, when it comes to correcting an individual in a timely manner. Uh, you know the time and how you do it, why you are doing it, is very important, right? And so, all of this is talking about uh, the divine order in of page uh, of chapter twenty. Um, and so uh, that's it about today, guys. I hope there was something that you could take away from today's lesson. We'll uh, stop the class now. Apologies for going two minutes over time. Uh, we'll stop the recording now, and I'll see you all next week. Okay? You guys take care. God bless. Bye.